How do you prepare to go from being a farm worker to a contract milker? What are some things to be aware of? What are the foundations for success? And how do you avoid the common mistakes? This episode of Talking Dairy is the first of a three-part series on contract milking, which we'll be rolling out over the next few months. You'll get some top-notch practical advice from farm owner and ag consultant Brenda Natural and Waikato contract milker Rachel Foy. My name is Ben Chapman Smith and I hope you enjoy this episode. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you get notified when new episodes go live. Let's get into it. Rachel, could you kick things off by telling us a bit about yourself, please? Where are you farming and uh, how many seasons have you been contract milking for? Yeah, good day, everyone. Um, so I'm farming in North Waikato, Ohiniwai, which is just north of Huntley. Contract milking 730 cows this season. This is my fourth season on this farm. And then I did one season contract milking on a 400 cow farm before I came here. Yeah, and just come come up through the dairy farming ranks, I guess, to, to get to contract milking now. And Brendan, introduce yourself, please, to our listeners. Hi, folks. Yeah, I farm um, with my wife, Susan, and we own a, a dairy farm in Toko, just east of Stratford. 350 cows self-contained. And had a bit of a mixed background. I've been lucky enough to, to manage a corporate farming entity for a decade. And I've got my own um, farm supervision business at the moment, which I look after just under 20 farms. And a number of those have got contract milkers on board. Rachel, let's start with the, the basics. What is contract milking? Yeah, so contract milking is an agreement that the contract milker will sign with the farm owner or farm owners. And you get a set amount of dollars per kilogram of milk solid paid to you. So you're self-employed, basically contracting to the farm owners to, to run the farm, uh, employ the staff and pay some of the farm running costs. So typically those costs will be motorbikes, uh, electricity for the cow shed and, and water pumps. You're paying your own staff, generally pay rubberware for the cow shed and detergents. But each like each contract is different. So there'll be differences within within each contract job. So like on this farm, I pay for, oh, I have to like provide a calf trailer and a mag spreader and pay for cow shed hoses and spray paint, but I don't pay for calf rearing equipment, whereas some contract milkers would. So yeah, it just depends on what the farm owner's policies are and what they what they want you to pay for versus what they've already got. And yeah, you can sort of just work it out between you, I guess, when you, when you actually sign up. Brendan, do you think, is contract milking still a good option for people who want the independence of running their own business and who want to grow their wealth? Yeah, look, contract, contract milking is actually one of the the new tools that we've got um, in the industry to promote young couples and individuals who want to dive into running their own business and with a view to, towards developing a, a career in the industry. So it's a very good step off point for a qualified manager or couple who have spent years fine-tuning their trade in relation to cows and grass, and they really want to get into a profit sharing or discover how to run their own business from a day-to-day basis. So it's a really good tool. It's a, If it's the right contract and it's managed the right way and people discover all the information that they need to within that agreement, it's still a very, very good vehicle to get starting along your journey. You mentioned that it's a new tool. What What do you mean by that? Well, it's relatively new compared to our industry. The um, contract milking has really um, only developed to its current form over the last decade. And we've had the shear milking accords and variable or shear milking agreements in place since the 60s. So contract milking is relatively new um, and it's developed primarily because it's two reasons. It allows couples to have with less risk appetite to actually move into running their own business. As opposed to shear milking, where you're on a wave um, and you've got the ups and downs of the milk price and uh, and also the climatic conditions and other entities that might change within your business. So contrary milking is a nice tool with lower levels of risk to start building your business skills and developing your, your place in the industry um, so you can move forward. Rachel, what attracted you to contract milking? Yeah, the, the ability, like Brendan said, the ability to run your own business and and be self-employed and if you can manage it right and are in the right role there's a lot of benefits to doing that yeah and so for me I'm obviously reaping the the benefits and 
um, enjoying what I'm doing. So yeah, it's it's a right it's the right fit for me at the moment. So it's you know you're able to to keep generating that cash and not having it tied up in in cows means that you can invest elsewhere if, if you're wanting to, which is yeah sort of what I've what I've chosen to do. What skills do you need to be a successful contract milker? Most people would have come like through the ranks of the dairy industry, so sort of from farm assistant up to manager. So they should already have those farm management skills in place. But then the difference with contract milking is that you're you're running a business, so you need to have the skills around finance and managing your own money, compliance and employment law if you're employing staff. Yeah. So Brendan, if you don't have those skills already, those you know that the business know how and such, how do you obtain them? Well, the, the most important thing is as a contract milker is to hitch with the right entity. So hitch with a couple or a farming entity that have got a background in developing people. So you identify who you want to be in partnership with and you pretty aggressively try and and, and target those entities that you know have got um, a track record on, on developing people. So once you've hitched with the right couple and uh, family or entity, whatever that might be, then it's all about discovering, okay, where are my um, toolbox gaps? So, for example, if you're coming from a managing um, position, you may be very good in exactly what Rachel's saying. You may be very good in cows and grass, but now you've actually got to build your skills to, to actually run your wider business, and particularly around staff management. So hitch with the right people. Discover the, um, the holes in your toolbox. So what, what, what tools are you missing from your toolbox? And then from that point onwards, go and discover, and Deer in New Zealand's a very good way to, to do that, how we're going to build the, that toolbox and, and get some, some really good um, strength around those parts of your business that you may have some weaknesses. And is it better to try and acquire those skills before you go into contract milking, or is it okay to sort of develop them once you get into it? Okay, that's a, real, that's a very good question. So the how, how that I um, work in with the couples that I work with is that there's a key component of contract milkers that they have to have in place. So they have to be good with cows. They have to be very good in that compliance space. They have to be very good in pastures. Now, if they've got those three um, platforms in place, then we can build the rest. So the key thing is work on that platform with those three um, points first. And then you can definitely learn in the job. That's the beauty of contract milking. The ability in Taranaki is that, is that our, our jobs in Taranaki are very small compared to the likes of uh, Rachel's job and also the South Island and, and um, other parts of the country. So what we can do is take a young, keen couple with the right attitude that have got those three foundation points in place and we can build the rest in the small units. And then they can step and really drive from a smaller unit into a larger unit that Rachel's actually um, contract milking on at the moment. Brendan, we often hear about people who go into contract milking without understanding how you get paid, the ins and outs of that. Can you explain the cash flow issues and therefore what kind of savings somebody might need to put aside before they go into contract milking? Okay, so every job is different. So that's the first thing. So in the recruitment process, make sure you do talk a lot about what costs that you've got in your contract milking agreement. What's the seasonality of supply and and the for for the for the farm that you're you're partnering up or hitching with? Once you've got that base information, then you can work towards creating a cash flow. And a cash flow for contract milkers is very, very important. One key message is that your lenders or your bankers or banking partner, they're going to need good information. So you need to know your figures. You need to provide real good information for um, for your banking partner. So that, that that's a key point. So in relation to how you're going to be paid, there's really two options. You can be tied to the milk processor who, um, for example, when you produce a kilo of milk, then you, you um, paid your contract rate. The upside of that is it gives you business exposure to um, Fonterra or Sinlay or Open Country Cheese or whoever it may, it may be. The downside is linking to the co-op is that you've got a stretch of time from June through to September or October where you're going to have no income. Now, an average size farm in Taranaki, 300 cows, you'd really want to be going into having forty to $50,000 of either cash or available credit available to, to start your contract. If you're at Rachel scale, 
the figure is going to be much bigger because you've got staff to carry for those four or five months. You're probably going to be looking at um, paying some higher costs at the starting of the season compared to smaller smaller units. So that's the link to the milk processor, and that's very successful in a lot of cases. The other option is that you work with your entity that you're hitching up with or your um, family and get them to pay you a set fee on the 20th, 20th of each month. And then you have a top up payment at the, in the June following. So for young couples going into contract milking, I always like this as a really good vehicle because of what it means is it reduces the risk. Um, it means that they don't have to have a lot of financial um, backing to actually start their career. And they know on the 20th of June, they get their first payment. Now, owners or entities, we may pay out 90% of, of the expected production over the 12 months and split it equally into 12 equal payments and then have the final payment um, in June following. As you get bigger and you discover more about the industry and you want to feel more engaged with the milk processor that you're working with, going to a direct payment from the processing side could be a, a, a bit of a process that you're on or where you want to, want to um, end up. But for young couples starting their career, having a bit more security and lowering the risk are, are key points. Mm, that's great. Thanks, Brendan. Rachel, I was interested in knowing what your first sort of three to six months were like as a contract milker. Had you prepared yourself well for that? Yeah, I had. Yeah, so I'm, so Brendan was talking about the two payment options. I've never had the, the you know, set regular payments through the 12 months. That's never been an option for either job. It was, you were paid by Fonterra. That's who we were supplying the month after you produce that milk. So I've always had, or for the last five years, had those those few months where you're not getting paid anything or being paid very little. And I think that's where a lot of people trip up going contract milking. Like they've got all the management skills, all the people skills, all the compliance. But if you can't manage your finances, you're going to fall over because you you've got to be able to budget ahead knowing that you're not going to have any income. But for me, I've still got to pay three to three and a half staff members over those three months. Um, I might have to buy new bikes or there'll be other costs that come up. I've still got to live. You've got a budget to get through those three months or four months or however long it might be. And then then the, the flip side is then when you do start producing milk, sort of October, November, December, you get nice big milk checks coming in. But then you've got to not go out and spend 20 grand on a on a holiday or a new ute or something because you've got to realise that you've got tax implications, you've got other costs that you've got to meet, you've got to be able to spread that cash throughout the year. So that's where monitoring that cash flow is really critical. You mentioned a little bit about machinery and utes and things like that. What kind of machinery might you need before you start your contract? It, it really depends on the size of the job. So where I am now, I've got, I was required to have two four wheelers or I've actually got a, a four wheeler and a and like a like a jeep sort of thing I've got three two wheelers because I've got three staff members I uh, had to have a calf trailer a mag spreader you need to have your own hand tools sort of basic tools you may or may not have a ute that sort of depends on you really the smaller jobs you might only need like a two wheeler and a quad and probably if it's only you on the farm too can make the keep those uh, motorbike costs down a little bit. But yeah, that's probably the main stuff. So like with contract milking, you don't have to go out and buy a tractor or anything like that. It's it's just basically just your motorbikes. You do need to think about what your staff, additional staff costs will be. So on top of wages, you've probably got, you know, you're probably providing wet weather gear and gum boots and you might be providing them all a set of poly grips and a hammer or something. So there, there are a few other little costs that add up. I guess always have a bit of a contingency cost of, of a couple of grand into that budget as well because there's always stuff that comes up. That's the story of life, basically. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Brendan, can you please talk about the professional advice that you might need, talking about accountant, solicitor, farm advisor, to help you assess a contract milking job and, and then you know getting advice on an ongoing basis as well? Cool. So, so the first the first thing is surrounding yourself in positive people. I mean, that that's the when you have a look at successful contract milkers and you look at their their team around them, it starts with their family, um, their owner, and then their professional party. So the key thing is 
target people with great attitude, with connections, people that you know have taken contract milkers on a journey towards, for example, herd owning share milking. So, so make sure you're picky in that space. Your immediate decision making um, group needs to involve, it needs to include some really cool friends that are on the on the same journey. So, a contract milking family or couple that you have a lot to do with. Make sure you've got a mentor in that space that you can talk to in relation to something's going wrong in the contract or you've got a bit of tension or a roadblock. How do we how do we move it forward? So have some nice supporting family members uh, wrapped around you. Then the key ones from there, in no particular order, but probably your lender, so your your banking partner. Some of the banks have got dedicated share milking and contract milking agri managers. So targeting one of those people with a good reputation, similar age is important. And again, someone who you know is supporting the, the contract milking or share milking space. Accountant is very important. And particularly, Rachel's already mentioned the word tax. Tax in year one and year two is critical. A number of contract milkers fail because they have poor investment decisions in year one and two, and then they run into significant issues with GST, terminal tax and provisional tax. So a good accountant, someone that can do the compliance stuff around compl- uh, accounting around your business, but also offer you some advice around how to grow, who are good entities to hitch with, someone with contacts in the industry. And then probably a lawyer is going to be important or a good farm consultant who can do two things. One, a good farm consultant's um, exposed to a number of contract milking agreements and they'll know, they'll be able to sit down and, and work your way through what, you know, the content of the agreement. And that's very important. A lawyer is important when you come down to the tin tax of an agreement and particularly at Rachel's scale, if you're getting up to 700 cows, five to 600 cows, you need to be inviting more professional people into your business because you're, you're dealing with quite significant numbers. So build a little team, make sure they're positive and make sure they can take you on a journey. Like you really want your team to, to take you on a journey towards your end goal. And I'm hoping for a lot of people listening that that'll be herd owning share milking. How are we going to get herd owning share milking? What's the best vehicle to get there? Um, so just, yeah, hitch, hitch, hitch with the right owner and, and groups and nice positive people. Brendan, Federated Farmers provides a lot of support for contract milkers, I understand. Should farmers join to get that, to, you know, to access that support? Yeah, look, Federated Farmers have got, um, in my mind, the best contract milking agreement on the market. It's reviewed regularly. The share milk employer section and, and share milkers section, who I was a member for, for a decade with some pretty cool people, they review all the contracts and they... They review the direction that the contract milking um, is heading and they make changes to the agreements and they uh, make sure that they are flexible in relation to where the industry is heading. A classic at the moment would be all the compliance regulations in space. So there'll be some stuff being started building into our contract milking agreements that feeds in relation to, to what contract milkers and owners need to do to get the compliance stuff um, tidy. Should they be members? Of course they should be members. I know it's a significant cost. But what it does, it opens up a lot of support, not only from Federated Farmers, but also from the members of Federated Farmers. And a lot of these members of Federated Farmers are employing contract milkers and share milkers and variable order and herd owning share milkers. And so it's all about getting your network going and belonging to feds, having access to those brilliant contracts, having access to the share milker section, share milker and the share milk employer section, who actually got a key responsibility to support contract milking in, in the industry. So it's important that we do allow that process that all the parties are putting together to, to continue. And the Fed's um, subscription is all part of that. Rachel, let's talk about tax. What are the tax requirements for a contract milker? Oh, give me the fun questions, eh? <laughs> um, so the first thing to realise is that when you're working for someone else, you don't have to worry about tax because it comes out of your wages as PAYE before you receive your net pay or your in-hand pay each week or fortnight, depending on how often you're paid. But then when you become self-employed or you own a business, such as contract milking, you're responsible for paying your own tax each year. So to be able to do that, you need to have an accountant work out your tax requirements for you. And it's it's probably a good idea to get an accountant before you actually sign up to your first 
contract milking job because they can also help you decide what sort of entity you want to trade under because this this will have tax implications as well. So I trade as a company, but I'm sure there'll be lots of contract milkers that are in partnerships and there's the sole trader option as well. And your accountant can help you decide for what all of those mean and what the tax implications are for that and, and any setup costs and stuff of doing that. So once you're up and running, you'll have GST to pay and file every two months. And depending on your arrangement with your accountant, you might be doing some or part of it yourself. Um, you might be doing the coding or you can get, get them to do that for you. You also need to calculate and pay PAYE for any employees that you have. Um, and that's for every pay cycle. So I pay fortnightly, so I need to be working out the PAYE and putting payments through every fortnight. And using like a payday filing and recording system is probably the easiest way to do that. There's plenty of those available now, plenty of options. And especially with multiple staff, like there's so much compliance and, and recording requirements around leave and hours and pay that it really is just worth paying the paying the monthly fee and having the system there to do it for you. And then of course you've got your income tax and that's in the form of provisional and terminal tax. So your accountant can advise how much you need to pay and when it's due once they once they do your annual accounts at the end of your financial year. And it's it's real important to set money aside or at least have the tax in your budget so that you're able to pay on time. Otherwise, there's pretty big penalties from IRD and they'll get quite costly. And probably the important thing to realise is that your second year in business, and I think Brendan alluded to that earlier, that can sting quite a bit because you get your provisional tax for that year and then you've also got terminal tax from your first year in business. And then just one more thing is your ACC requirements. It's not exactly a tax, but it is still a cost that contract milkers need to think about. So even if you don't employ staff, you still have to have ACC cover for yourself. And that's, yeah, that's something that your accountant can help you sort through and you work out your requirements. And But your yeah, big, big thing is just making sure that, that those ACC and tax payments are paid on time. Otherwise, yeah, you wouldn't believe the interest payments on those. I think they can be, they can be quite hefty. And Rachel, what do I need to know about taking time off? Is it any different to being in any other kind of farm position? Yeah, contract milkers are notorious for not taking much time off, generally because it means that you've got to pay someone to cover that you're not there. So yes, it's important to still do that and to have outside interests, but I guess realising that the buck stops with you and if if your staff member isn't there or is away sick or doesn't turn up or there's a, there's a problem on farm, it's you that's going to have to deal with it. So yeah, understanding that it's it's your business and you've got this this massive vested interest in wanting to be there. But then the other side of that is also making sure that you do take some time off to reset and, and recharge. And even if that's only half a day, like during your busy times, like I, that, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit like that, like during carving and mating, don't take a whole heap of time off because there's so much happening and it's so critical to your income and your business. But even just having like a few hours or an afternoon and then the odd the odd sleeping can be quite good, and you're making sure that, that you that you do take a little bit more later on in the season when things aren't quite as chaotic. Hey, and Brendan, you touched on it a little bit earlier about making sure that you you know you get into the right partnership. But can you talk about that relationship that you'll need to form with the farm owner? What works well, and, and what are some common challenges that people face? Okay, so the the first thing is that when you um, secure a contract milking agreement, you need to celebrate that. Well done you've got a contract milking agreement, you've actually put a foundation in for the next step for your industry progression. So it's excellent. So reflect on that, tidy up any loose ends, and that might be stuff like making sure that you've talked about who's covering or what day you're coming in in relation to when the, the contract starts, et cetera, et cetera. So the key thing for me is the first 100 days, okay? So you've got a 100-day snapshot to get this right. And to me, that means that you've got 100 days of clear air where generally your business is not under tension. If you're seasonal dairy farming, it means you've got 100 days to bed the relationship in. You can clarify what the working conditions are and expectations of you. You need, need to work on your combined decision-making um, tools. You know, who's responsible for what? Where do you as a contract milker come in to make a decision and where does the owner? There's going to be road bumps. So you, you need to learn what is a road bump, 
identify it, and then move on. And the key thing for my end is that when you're starting, be very keen to lead, but slow to control. And that's going to be it in the first 100 days. If you take that attitude on board, it will see a long way because you've got to realise that your person that you've hitched with will be feeling a bit of tension. They'll be feeling a little bit of awkwardness around a new person on their, on their farm. They'll be wanting to bed you in as contract milkers as quickly as you can. So the 100-day clear area window, concentrate on that. Be prepared to change your thinking, to be flexible in those 100 days and make sure that by the time carving starts, you've actually bedded in those key decision points and you've got a very nice plan as the tension comes on in your business because we're all busy when we start carving and that's when relationships can fracture pretty quickly. That point you made there about leading but not controlling, I think I've got that right. Could you talk a bit more about that? Okay, so when they decide to put a contract milker on, owners are looking for a partner. In a lot of cases, they're looking for an entity to work with, to better relationship in with. They're not looking for a contract milking couple or individual to come in and dominate their business and or change their decision making. They want a partnership approach. So be keen to lead, but be very slow to control. And then over time, if you take that approach, the owner will hand over more responsibility. And when they see that you've got capability and they feel confident about your skills, they will gradually start to um, hand over more of the decision-making tools. And that's where you want to be within 80 months to two years. But just at the start-up, remember the 100-day window. Bed the relationship in. There's going to be hiccups. There's going to be roadblocks. How do you manage those? And then by the time you start that first carving, um, you've got clear expectations for um, each party. Yeah, that's excellent advice. Thank you. Brendan, we're coming to the end of this podcast, but let's finish with some really practical stuff for listeners. I mean, you've already offered a lot just then, but can you give us a bit of a step-by-step guide to what you need to do before you take on a contract milking job? Right. Yeah. So you've been offered the position, you've signed, you've got a uh, steer clear now for um, the next seasonal milk supply um, period. So you, first thing is feel confident about that. Feel positive that you've got a, got a new ag- agreement in place. Your negotiations were successful. So celebrate the positive aspects of that. The work begins from that point. So the key thing is between, for example, a lot of contract milkers, they get their offer and contract signed in January, February, early March. One of the key points is stay connected to the owners or the entity you've hitched with right through until the day you go onto the property. Now, what that does, it it gets the communications going. You feel confident in picking up the mobile or WhatsApping someone. You know, what are we doing in that space? It means there'll be no surprises come the 1st of June. So you turn up, you've had good communication for the last three months, you know exactly what you're going into. One of the most important things for partners, for example, will be the house, the standard of the house, the cleanliness and tidiness of the house. And that's a very important discussion you have a month on the lead up to the 1st of June. So you've done that, you're now in the house. And the key thing at that point is be very clear with the owners. What is the first day they expect me to take management of the cows? Can you please put me through a safety induction on the property? Can you please put me through an induction on using all the machinery and vehicles on the property? Can we talk about the compliance aspects? If you're winter milking, for example, key thing would be knowing what cows have got some antibiotics actually rolling through the for, for treatment of uh, mastitis. So, Ben, the, the key thing is it's just all about communication. And where a lot of guys go wrong and couples go wrong is they get the role and then there's no communication from that point until they turn up and then all of a sudden all these tension points start rolling out. So you've got a nice free zone of communication from the time you sign, sign your contract right through to the 1st of June when you start and take advantage of that. Feel good about that. Make sure that you're talking with your entities and and your owners on a regular basis. And little road bumps will come up, you deal with them, and then move on. Brilliant. Hey, we'll we'll finish it up in in a second, guys, but I'd just love to get any final thoughts you've got on this topic. Rachel, over to you first. 
yeah, so make sure that you've got your accountant in place and your bank manager and they know what's happening. So as, as Brendan said, communication is really important. So make sure that they know what what things you've got to purchase before you start because you don't want to spring any sudden costs onto your bank manager and your accountant won't be too happy if you add big items onto your budget that aren't supposed to be there. And then if you're employing staff, make sure that you're getting, start employing your staff before you start your contract milking job. I was able to take staff or potential staff through um, for tours of the farm before I started. So that was really good. The farm owners were, were quite happy for me to do that so I could actually interview staff on their kitchen table because I obviously wasn't living in the house yet and um, could take them around the farm so they knew what was happening and look at the shed. So, that, But that all comes from building that relationship with the farm owners or the, or the business that you've signed up to go contract milking with in those months before you actually start. Oh, and Brendan? Probably the, the final thing, and it's quite, a, quite an important point for me, is that when you start your contract milking journey, make sure you've got a business plan. You need to know your numbers, and you need to know the numbers within your contract. It's very important. You need to focus on your toolbox. What are your strengths in your toolbox, and what are your weaknesses? You also need to, within that business plan, you need to develop skills to like people. You're going to need to be good in that space. If you want to progress, in our industry, you need to like working with people and you want to be very good at developing people. So make sure that's in your business plan and make sure that you've got individual skills, make sure they're at work on the right position. Everyone is different in our skill set. You've got individual great skill set. Make sure you're putting those skills to work in the right position and make sure you get the detail right within your, everything you do. And if you achieve that, the owners are going to pick up on that, and they're going to, that's a very good way of actually partner, partnering for um, progress within your own business. Rachel and Brendan, thank you so much for your time. It's very generous of you, and I really appreciate your insights and your knowledge, and uh, looking forward to getting you back for part three of this contract milking series. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into Talking Dairy. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you'd like to check out more of our podcasts, go to dairynz.co.nz forward slash podcast or find us on your favorite podcast platforms. Catch you next time.